meeting to order. Um, with that, I'd like to start with the uh, invocation, and um, Pastor Deborah Bravo is here to lead us. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day, by the way. Uh, as you see, I'm not from here. I'm from Spain, from Madrid, actually. This is my second time blessing this time. And today, reading my Bible, God showed me in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah sent to Jesus people when they've been deported to Babylonia. And he said, pray and bless the city where you are moving. Because when that city is blessing, you are going to be blessing too. So that's because I'm coming to bless this meeting today. And also, because in Proverbs 11:11 11, 11 say, a city is built up by the blessings of the upright. This city is built by the blessing of everyone here. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's go and pray together. God, thank you for this afternoon. Thank you for this meeting, and thank you for everybody who is here. Thank you for the responsibility that we have in you, God. Thank you because you are blessing this country. Thank you because you are in control of every decision. You are in control in everything that is going to happen today. So, God, I pray now for wisdom, for knowledge. I pray, God, for everybody here, for every decision and every consideration, every apportation they are going to be doing today that made in you, God. I pray for that. I pray because I know that you are blessing Madison, Huntsville, and all the area here around and this beautiful country. <laughs> Thank you, God, because when you bless this country, you are blessing me and everybody here, every single family, and every single company, every single school, every single hospital. Oh, God, we are in your hands today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. You. Have a good meeting. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Mar, would you like to introduce? Yes, Staff Sergeant Sarah Robleski will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Sarah, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Can I get the roll call, please? Mayor Finley? Here. Council Member Robleski? Here. Council Member Spears? Here. Council Member Powell? Here. Council President Shaw? Here. Council Member Bartlett? Here. Council Member Denzine? Here. Council Member Seaford? Here. We have a quorum, so we'll move forward. Are there any amendments or changes to the printed agenda? If not, we'll move forward with what's printed, and I get approval for uh, minutes on January 24th. Move to approve. Second. Motion to second. Is there any discussion? If not, can I get the vote, please? Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council <laughs> President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Abstain. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. And approval for minutes of January 26. Move to approve. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? Can, can I get the vote, please? Council Member Seifert? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. And motion passes. Moving to presentation and awards, and we'll start with uh, Michelle Lin Linville. I think she's out. Very good. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, good evening. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Adriana Johnson. I'm the program director for Big Brothers Big Sisters of the Tennessee Valley. Um, so we were awarded some dollars for our Bigs in Blue or Bigs in Badges movement. Um, and that is a side of programming that started at the national level. And so the idea of that is to have our first responders, whether it's police officers, HIMSI, or firemen, to become mentors to break down those barriers for our youth in the community so when they need their first responders, they feel more comfortable contacting them. And so the funding will help um, with recruitment and sustaining our matches with background checks and things like that to move them through the process and then as well as having activities for our matches. And that's simple with Very good. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Ms. Heather Mason with uh, Heels. I'm Heather Mason, the Executive Director for HEALS, which is health establishments at local schools, and we currently provide medical, dental, and optometry care to underserved kids in Madison County. So we're excited about this partnership with the City of Madison and also the Madison City Schools to be able to start the process to bring our clinics to Madison. So what we're going to be using the grant funds for is dental screenings that we're going to be doing at Rainbow Elementary and Midtown in April. We couldn't get them in February, which is dental month because we were too busy, but <coughs> we'll be here doing those in April for the pre-K and kindergarten classes because those are the students you want to capture early. From those kids that we see we have issues, we'll refer them to be seen in one of our clinics in Huntsville or our other one in Madison County. And also exciting news that we are in the process, we've secured a grant to purchase a mobile medical unit, and so this is kind of to help us jumpstart and see which kids will need to follow up and be seen out here once we get that in place. So we're excited about the partnership. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. Next, we have, we have public comments. We have a couple of people signed up. So we'll start with uh, Ms. Michelle Splawn. Um, I wanted to speak to you today um, regarding some concerns that I had. Um, I've been attending the school board meeting since the fall. I'm up here speaking for our children and for our community. Something needs to change in Madison City Schools and decisions need to be made now. Families should not be having the conversation of wanting to move out of this beautiful area just so their <coughs> kids can have a fighting chance of a fair education. Citizens and families feel ignored. You were elected to serve the people of your community. It is now time for you to step up and serve your people. Our children attend schools to learn. Teachers are teachers because they want to teach. The school dress code's not been followed for years, but wearing a mask is completely different and punishable by being sent to the principal's office or being made to sit out during their only activity time, PE. And this is happening. I cannot tell you how many times I've walked into a school board, into a school building, and the staff in the front office do not have a mask on. They scramble to find their mask to put it on before a parent sees them. I really don't blame them. Who really wants to wear a mask all day? Because our kids sure don't. If masks are so effective, it does not matter whether the child next to them wears one or not. It's just my opinion. Although I may feel that most do not care, I will say it anyway. My child cannot handle the mask due to medical conditions. He cannot fully breathe through his nose. This means he cannot move the mask below his nose and it make a difference. Can you really imagine if you were to wear a mask in this condition for seven plus hours, expect to learn new material, and then be reprimanded for giving yourself a mask break in order to breathe properly? With this being said, I'm asking you to please get involved and show everyone in your community that you do care and that their feelings are not being ignored. I'm up here telling you that they do feel ignored. You have the chance now to be the hero. Everyone at this meeting tonight has jobs, families, and volunteer commitments, but just like you, we take the time out of our busy lives to be here. Everyone in this room has something in common. We all have something or someone that is important to us, someone that is worth fighting for. Decisions should be up to the parents regarding their children. There should be no wavering on that topic. I'm asking you to stand up and be the hero. Whether you realize it or not, everyone is watching. Please be that hero. Yes, ma'am. Right, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, De Declan Giles. Hello. 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 Oh. My, 
name is Declan Giles. I want to share the speech that I read to the Madison City Board of Education on February 3rd. I hope it helps you understand how it feels to be a student right now. I'm a sixth grade student at Liberty, and before that I was a student at Heritage. Being a student has been different for almost two school years, and now it's very hard. I feel like people couldn't understand me through my mask, and it's hard to get to know people if you can't understand them. I have sensory problems. Uh, says thing disorder, and I have a hard time with some things. Wearing a mask makes my feel face feel very hot, and it's hard for me to breathe. I've also had a hard time seeing in class because wearing a while wearing a mask because my glasses are prone to fogging up. Wearing a mesh mask has been a good solution for m me, and something I've talked about with my doctor, my counselor, and my OT. My doctor sent a letter to my school explaining the things I need. But I have been told at school that I'm trying to get people sick, and that makes me really upset. I'm afraid of getting in trouble at school, and I cried in class one time when my teacher sent me to the office over masks. I'm upset that I'm forced to do something that's hard for me to do in order to go to school. I've talked with my parents about not going to school anymore or changing schools, but I'd really like to stay in my school with my friends and not have it be so hard. Since we came back to school after Christmas, none of my teachers have given us math breaks at Liberty. They said we have too much floor to do. Oh, oh. It's really hard to be at school all day in a mask without a break. It's hard to understand my teachers' emotions when they are teaching us because I can't see their faces. I'm really grateful for my innovative explorations class I took last semester and for Ms. Schmidt. It was a safe class where I could relax, take math breaks, and eat my snack. This nine weeks, I'm really grateful for Dr. Francois, who teaches my German class. He doesn't get mad at me or send me to the office if I pull down my mask to have a snack. It's hard to be told that it's my responsibility to keep other people healthy. I just want to do a good job of taking care of myself. I'm only 11. Learning is hard when you're worried about getting in trouble. Learning is hard when you can't communicate easily with your teachers. I hope all of you make decisions that make it easier for me to learn and feel happy at school. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Ashley Dennis that signed up. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank, um, you. thank you for allowing us a few moments of your time. Uh, for the entire school year, we have fought the masking mandate placed on our students in our schools. I've even been here and spoken to you guys on occasion and pleading for your intervention to help and step in and speak up on behalf of our children, to which you all state that you have no oversight. You also also suggested that we should apply and sit in on the school board, and that's great and all, and we do intend to do that, however, but we need change right now. I refuse to believe that you do not have any pull, say, or authority over a board that you appointed. They must be held accountable to someone, and you place them in their position, so it is you who has the authority to say that this is enough. This masking mandate was never about the kids. After all, the kids were never at serious risk of COVID. No, this was to make the adults feel better. You, along with our school board, is choosing to sacrifice the psychological well-being of our children for the psychological well-being of adults. Does it make good sense to you that people who least need masks but suffer the most developmentally and, psychologi and psychologically are forced to continue to wear them while everyone else gets to take it off? Academy of Pediatrics, the Academy of Child and Adolescent Development and Psychology, and the Children's Hospital all agree and have declared a national emergency for mental health, citing 38% more department service or business, 54% and more suicide and self-harm cases in 2021 versus 2020. COVID is not the blame. The adults in authority are the blame. The message being communicated to our children on a daily basis is our God-given air is toxic, that our unmasked faces will cause our own sickness or worse yet, the sickness of others. This is abuse and your silence makes you complicit in this psychological abuse. The school board acknowledges that there is in fact a mental health crisis in our schools and the answer to us was to go and seek out our legislators, get more money so we can get more counseling services. I'm not an expert, but counseling a child and throwing them back into the environment causing the harm is not the answer, for example, you don't put an obese person on a diet plan and then hand them a gift card to McDonald's on the way out the door. It doesn't make good sense. All over the nation, blue cities are lifting these mandates, and here we are in Alabama, no less. 
still dealing with masking our children. Our children are fighting to exercise a basic freedom of breathing fresh air. And at this point, it's all about pride, not the care of our children. It's time for you guys to speak up. Our votes will follow us. And you have, you do have the say. You don't have, you do say that you don't have the oversight for the school board, but our votes do give us oversight over you. And it's time for you to make a stand and do something. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So that's everybody just signed up with public comments. So we'll move into consent agenda and finance committee report. Well, that's just everybody that signed. Oh. Is there anyone else like to address council? Okay. However y'all want to go. Come on. Come on. Come on, young man. There you go. Pull it down. Oh, baby. There you go. Yeah, pull it down. Keep pulling it. There you go. There you go. There you go. Good job. We can rebuild it. <laughs> there you go. My name is Isaac James Pittman. I'm nine years old and I'm in the third grade. I feel like some of the students in my class, I've either never seen their face, barely seen their face, or seen it so little that I forgot what it looked like. And my little brother is in special ed, and in special ed, he needs to read lips to fully understand people to full capacity, where he would know the full meaning of what they're talking about. And they can't do that when he can't even see their face or their lips so he can read them. And I'm just tired of all the time getting closer and closer to having to go to ISS for my mask dropping down or while I have something uh, like I'm eating and then it falls on the ground and I get in trouble. I'm tired of doing it. And I think the mask mandate should really stop. Thank you for listening and happy Valentine's Day. Thank, Thank you, sweetie. Thank you so much. Huh? having me. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm here tonight as many others to speak on the circumstances occurring in our Madison City School District. Um, many of you may not be aware of what these children and staff are going through. On August 4th, the first day of school, the, um, the students and staff have been under a mask mandate since that time um, while on campus. As this policy was implemented, Dr. Nichols assured the community that it would be reevaluated as COVID numbers started dropping. He kept his word and he went to mask preferred policy for a total of two school days. During this time, the children who did not choose to wear a mask were segregated away from their friends and their classmates under the direction of Dr. Nichols. Over those two days, many children felt that they had done something wrong or were being punished, especially younger students who had no concept that the measures being taken were related to masking. The policy of mandatory masking was quickly reinstated because of the lack of authority by Dr. Nichols to make these decisions. My first question to you is, if he had no authority to make that decision, how did he have the authority to implement, implement the policy in the first place? Over the, la over the course of this mandatory masking, there have been students that have been subject to being sent to the principal's office, like several have mentioned. There have been students that have been yelled at, punished in other circumstances, such as PE, um, being told by PE coaches for their masks falling below their noses that they had to do burpees until they got tired. 
meaning the PE coach got tired. Now, that's an implementation of masking and uh, strenuous activity while wearing a mask. I don't think anybody that has critical thinking skills, myself as a nurse, knows that that's safe for our students. Um, many of these issues have been brought to y'all previously on other occasions. I know that you have stated that you do not have authority over the board in which you have appointed, this body has appointed. My question to you is if you do not have the authority to hold them accountable for their behavior, for their policies, in many cases unlawful extension of wielding of power, who does? Who does have the authority to reel them in? And thank you for your time. Ma'am, what's your name just for the minutes? Sure, uh, Candy Andrews. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> okay, so my name is uh, Shanal Soni. I'm actually originally from Karachi, Pakistan. I am a NASA rocket scientist, and I'm working on taking us to the moon and then to the Mars. And I'm all about human evolution, which is why I'm working on a project like that. And what I really want to ask you guys, and I do believe that the answer is yes to the question, because it's uh, like if individuals need to live a free life, that's the only way they can have their, they live their highest potential. I come from a country where I wasn't even supposed to go to school. The literacy rate is very low. And not only that, I went to the school, I became a valedictorian. So I came to states, the United States of America, all about freedom. And right now, I really want to make a point about today's a Valentine's Day, happy Valentine's Day. It's all about love. So if you have to choose between love and fear, what would you choose? If you have to choose between the quality of life versus quantity of life, what would you choose? So <coughs> that is my, one of my biggest highlights I wanted to make. And then the thing is that, you know, we are fighting a disease and this ease. So if you really think about the word disease, it's almost like it's a, like what we're doing with this whole mask, it's creating a lot of uneasiness among the children, as you already heard them. And one of the things I wanted to share is that I actually have um, stumbled into this uh, declassified CIA paper that actually talks about how the hippocampus region is extremely important and responsible for human evolution. And then there's a Dr. Margaret who actually makes a very important point that when you keep depriving the neurons from the oxygen, then what happens ultimately it becomes a habit in our body and then you no longer get any symptoms of headache or dizziness or anything. And then even if you do take the mask off ultimately, which I'm hoping we will, you are no longer able to come completely revert back. And all of these kids, they all have a developing brain, and therefore we really are talking about human evolution, human mind, human brain. And Lao Tzu, basically, he has a quote which says, what your thoughts, they become your words. What your words, they become your action. What your action, they become your habit. What your habit, they become your character. And what your character, they become your destiny. So what I'm saying is that the CIA paper actually does prove and I can, I can show all the papers on it, that the thought becomes things. So I'm actually really wanting to highlight the fact that we really need to consider that the whole thing about education, I'm hoping education is all about evolution, and if that is the main reason we're sending our kids to school, then we need to focus on the bigger picture, and if there's a concern about disease or people dying of COVID, I actually am a health coach, certified health coach, and I have no problem helping raise awareness on how you can enhance your immune system because we truly want to take responsibility for our own health, every one of us, and we all have to learn and educate ourselves to the extent where we can show up the best in the world because, and we all believe in a power being <coughs> other than ourselves that is choreographing this whole thing, so why would we not make all of that work together? It's all about togetherness because we are stronger together. And I truly mean it that I'm more than willing to raise awareness. And if I need to get someone uh, to work with me, I'm willing to volunteer my time and help the school system so that we can truly uh, be the healthy human species. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. That's everyone. Yes, ma'am. name and your address for the record also. I don't do address, just name. Just name. Um, hi, my name is Tiffany Pittman, and I have been a resident of Madison for 38 years. I was born and raised here. 
Um, my mom and I actually have a small accounting firm down the road. So this has been my home, and I'm very proud to be from here. I've got two boys in elementary school. You heard from the one. And, um, you know, I, I understand that everyone is in, but you know, particularly you guys are in between a rock and a hard place. There's intellectual giants on both sides of this debate, um, you know, mask mandating and leaving it up to a choice. Ultimately, I think that the fact that our students and our teachers and ourselves, we can go anywhere outside of school and we have a choice of whether or not we mask ourselves and mask our children. But inside of the school, the children and teachers are forced to mask. And I feel like that sends a, a, a disturbing message that somehow our schools are uniquely more dangerous than anywhere else in the community. And that I also think that that sends a message that schools are uniquely punitive. And that narrative is disturbing to me. I was raised in these schools, and I, that's not the message that I think any of us want to send. So I hope that you will use what influence you have to um, make everyone comfortable with transitioning away from mask mandates and allow it to be a decision that's between parents and their children. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for the wonderful prayer. That was amazing. Um, she doesn't get that at school, so I really like that. I want to compliment you guys. Um, so I'm, I'm Shima. Um, I just want to, this is, I'm going to make several statements. It's just very informative because I want you guys to know what's going on in schools. Um, you know, we felt like, like everyone says, we've really communicated ourselves to death, literally. Um, so we've been forced to file a lawsuit. So I wanted to make you aware of that. You probably already know. Um, but because people are ignoring the harms of masking. They've had two mental health fair, well, mental health fair, I'm sorry, is coming up next month. And then there was one held um, back in September and there was no address of harms of masking. Um, so we, so we, we come to this conclusion because we want to ensure that no one ever can, in, in, can, can overstep on parental rights. So that's the reason for the lawsuit mainly, because the board is assuming arbitrary power over us, and especially for those of us that choose not to mask because we actually see harms in our own family. Um, let me see what else I'm saying. Oh, I wanted to touch on a few things because we we've all worked really hard. We've you know we volunteer our time too, trying to advocate for our families and things like that. And so I want you to make you aware that Madison City ha did. Um, I ha I had to help them, but they did um, commit vaccination discrimination on some kids. They were trying to say that hey, because they were unvaccinated and those kids want to tell the truth, that they needed to go home and and quarantine or isolate while the vaccinated kid could go back to school immediately the next day. So I did call them out on that, and um, Nichols did address it in a, in a posting, and then the Madison City PTA did address it, too, after I, after I helped them. Um, and then recently, I wanted to talk about my little one. She's in first grade. Um, she had a stuffy nose on Friday, and so they called me and told me to come pick her up on a stuffy nose. So um, after I took a few deep breaths there, I said, okay. So I, I went to go get her, and they wanted me to take her to the doctor. So I just want to let you guys know what families go through. So I went to pick her up. I took off of work to pick her up. Today, I had to, I took her um, on Sunday. She's, she was pretty hyper yesterday. I took her, um, I was like, there's no justification for you to stay home. You know, you need to go back to school. And so we took her to school today. They called me, and they wanted the doctor's note, and I didn't have the doctor's note. So they want me to take time off from work, go get a doctor's note, come back to school um, because they, because I guess, you know, what COVID has done is made children think and families think that our kids are <coughs> causing people to die and they're making people sick, and they're not. So I really want to encourage you guys to help us stop that message that our kids, you know, whether you want to ma wear a mask or not, that you're, you're still, you're not causing people to get sick and you're not causing people to die. Um, so this is what she has went through today. She missed her Valentine party today because – they refuse to keep her at school, and she has, uh, she's pretty healthy. So I just want to, I want you to empathize and understand what, the, what we're all going through. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think 
that's I think that's everybody. Is there any, anyone else? Somebody's calling in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the consent agenda and finance committee report. Okay, finance committee has reviewed the consent agenda items and the periodic bills, and I move to approve the consent agenda items. Second. Motion is second. Is there any discussion? And can I get the vote, please? Councilmember Bartlett? Aye. Councilmember Spears? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Councilmember Robleski? Here. Councilmember <laughs> Council Member Powell? Aye. Councilmember Denzine? Aye. Councilmember Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. So we'll move into presentation reports and we'll start with the mayor. All right, and usually I start with number one, but I'm going to start addressing everybody who came tonight. You know, I know last, it, you come here, you tell us what you think. We don't, we're pretty stoic up here. We are listening. We are sharing this information. I had seven different people come up. Nobody spoke about anything else in the city but that. It will get back to both the superintendent and the school board that we talk to, uh, not every day, but most every day, and they will hear who came to our meeting and what we heard and then we will let them know. So I don't want you to think that we just listen and just placate and go away. But again, there is a separation of authority. You know, in the same sense when redistricting comes and, and all of a sudden they've got to make tough choices on, and again, it goes back to do it for the kids. My kid's gone to this school for three years and needs to go. They make really tough decisions. And, it, and this is a really tough decision. It is their responsibility to make. But we will share what we hear in the seven different people that it came and spoke about it for a bunch of different people that feel the same way. All right, as I go forward, I'm going to ask uh, to start with council support on resolution number 2022-09-R, approving the annual appropriation for Big Brothers Big Sisters of $5,000 to be paid for uh, in, from the general fund. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Can I get the vote? Council Member Powell. Aye. Council Member Denzine. Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. All right, thanks. And Council, I'll follow that up with resolution number 2022-32-R, approving the annual appropriation for the uh, for HEALS of uh, $5,000 to be paid for uh, by the general fund. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a couple of seconds. You can pick one. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. All right. Next, I would uh, like for Council uh, approval of Ordinance Number 2022 21, which is a restriction on the delivery of unsolicited written materials, and the first reading was January 24th. Move to approve. Second. Motion is second. Is there any discussion? Um, I actually wasn't here for that. I missed that meeting. So my question is, what do people do if they want to get that newspaper that has the coupons in it? Is there a plan to get them that information, or, or are we working with Huntsville Times on that? I think if they have a subscription, they get a paper. Mm -hmm. they're, what they're doing Those right now is just papers. simply giving us, that's not a free, it's a, but that's not a paper. It's right. advertisement put in a wrapper and thrown on your driveway gumming up our entire city. Right. Oh, I agree. So, I'm so saying as far that. as I, I don't have a good answer, if they want that, they can call um, AL.com. Okay. Um, and, and they could ask, that's ask for that. That's what I've been right. asked is how do they get it if they still want to sure. have it. Yep, okay. Right. Yep. Can I get the vote, please? Mm -hmm. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. And Mar, we will get an answer for you okay. on that. I think, yeah. we'll, you know, our biggest thing to start with was going the other direction. Sure. And for, for all those who don't want it right. and don't have any recourse as far as what to do, this will stop that. But we will get an answer on it. Perfect. What to do if you want it. Right. Thank right. you. And then lastly, uh, at left, uh, ask for council approval of resolution number 2022-54-R, and it's a resolution to provide a pay adjustment for our certified firefighter pay scale. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a second. I think so it's Karen or Mara. It's pretty yeah, good. Uh, you, me and Karen. Yeah, we'll give Teddy a rest on this one. <laughs> I, I, whatever you guys want to do. Motion and a second. 
And, and I think I think it would be a, a motion in six seconds if we had the chance. But with that said, you know, one of the things that we do is we work directly in listening to our chiefs um, and, and also the HR department on, from a pay standpoint, what can and should we do. Um, as you guys know, um, a, a few months ago, from a police standpoint, because pay had continued to rise throughout the course of North Alabama, uh, and it's a tough position to fill, we, we made an adjustment and adjusted pay for police by 10%. At that time, the fire department did not show that same uh, need because we were still, from a recruiting standpoint, in the position that we needed to be. And that has now changed. As multiple departments have changed their pay scales, we need to continue to be competitive, which is what Chief told us, what HR documented through data that they, got, that they received from other uh, areas. So this will make us far more competitive, and the goal is retention. Um, and, and uh, recruitment. And so with that said, it would be a 10% increase immediately for our certified firefighters um, to keep them in line with the other firefighters in this area to retain and recruit. Very good. Can, can I get the vote, please? Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passed. And thanks, Chief, for continuing to stay with us on that. Yeah. Um, and, and again, they have really expensive toys, too. So, it, it, you know, one of the other things we're looking for as we grow as a city is um, looking for another fire station, which would be most likely over in the town Madison area, not to not only be able to staff it, but also uh, have the equipment that's needed for that. And so continue to work with the department as they grow to look ahead to make sure because again quality of life starts with your safety and your health and they do a phenomenal job on the safety end of that and the health end for that matter mm -hmm. um, but that said it's all i have i still want to drive the fire truck <laughs> no issue number one yes sir um happy valentine's day as several have expressed i uh, want to sh give a shout out to my shop local spotlight massage envy if you have forgotten to give your loved one a valentine's day gift i highly recommend you see melissa march at massage and massage envy she's uh up there at the corner of 72 and Wall Triana, and in addition to massages, they also have facial treatments. So, highly recommend them. Uh, wanted to share that we had two wonderful comprehensive planning meetings led by our Development of Direct Director of Development Services um, concerning the comprehensive plan. We had the roundtable for council and the town hall. Um, the other council members will probably speak to it too, but the town hall in particular was fabulously attended. I was thrilled with the number of people that were here and were engaged and there were activities um, for people to participate in. So it's a fully engaged community event. I encourage you to follow the website and, um, and be involved in that process. I was able to attend a book club conference at the library and would encourage everyone uh, that would like to get involved with that to check out the library in Madison. We have uh, many different book clubs and I also attended the McDab meeting and Friends of the Library meeting and just hope you all have a wonderful Valentine's Day and that's all I have. Thank you, Mara. District number two. Um, I attended the Madison Utilities meeting last Monday <coughs> and as y'all know, our um, area is growing in and outside of the city and all of those developments affect our roads and such and so we need to work try and work with um, Madison Utilities to see if we can't figure out a path forward um, and then happy Valentine's Day I also attended the comprehensive plan meetings I think that this is a great way for our city to become involved in helping form what our future will be please look at the website and give your input. They're looking for comments and also there's an interactive map that you can use to highlight um, strengths and opportunities for our city. So that's all. Thank you. District number three. No new business. District number five. Well, Saturday, I was so pleased to host the All-Girls State Chess Championship at Hexagon. It was sponsored by State Senator Orr and Hexagon, and I was thrilled to be able to introduce that facility to our own families as well as those from around the state who came to compete. We had a record-setting uh, attendance of 56 girls competing. Girls are very outnumbered in chess, so that's 
uh, why we hold that event. Uh, it was great connecting uh, the skills that they develop in playing chess with STEM. And so uh, we had a fantastic time, and I was so pleased to be able to show off a Madison company uh, to people from around the state. And this is the fifth year that we have hosted that event. Uh, just to piggyback on the Madison on track comprehensive planning process, this Friday is the deadline to participate with that map and put your feedback in the initial phases. And so that's on our website. And we'd love to hear from our residents in terms of the strengths and opportunities that we have as a city as we grow. And then tomorrow, February 15th, is National School Resource Officer Appreciation Day. That was announced by NASRO, and the governor has also uh, declared that as an appreciation day. So when you see an SRO, please thank them for their service in our schools, and that's all I have. Very good, thank you. District number six. All right, um, I do believe it's very important that people do voice. I've talked to several of you that are here tonight that have spoken. I love that you are here. It shows your commitment. Okay, yes, I am the liaison between the school board and the city council. I respect their decisions because we did appoint them and we really do not I cannot go to them and say this is what I want you to do they work independently but that doesn't mean I don't listen and try to understand everyone's situation I've been meeting with citizens throughout our city um, and I had this on before you all even showed up today because I think it's important to get out and talk to the citizens I've met with citizens to discuss the Hughes project the proposed mini roundabout in Eastview, our school system, the proposed change of the way we do government in the city, the help grants of plan, and sometimes we've covered several of these things at one time. I've met in living rooms, I've met at the coffee place over here, I've met in offices. Um, I just want everyone in dis the 6th District to know I do listen, and if you want to reach out to me, just email me, I will get together with you and we can talk because I think that is the best way for me to represent you, is to understand, especially as we come up with the, uh, the change in government, I really would like to know what the people of the 6th District are thinking. I think that's important before we make our decision here um, and that sort of thing. So to me, that was a big highlight of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, other things, the Madison Police Citizen Advisory Committee, their next meeting is February 22nd at 6.30 here in Chambers. The topic is domestic violence. Uh, the beautification board, they are looking for additional board members. If anybody's interested in that, please contact me or Karen Lawler. Um, I've also been asked about the application process for the school board. Uh, you can go in now and apply if that's what you want to do. I asked earlier, I don't know if there's been a time set for the last, the last application. The last time frame is, do you know? Is is there a is there a date is there a cutoff date for that? I don't know. I don't know. We Let can me research check on that. For you. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, it's last time we did interviews in April, so just know that it is coming up. Just go to the website and apply. Um, and I know, as far as when I look at these, I look at you for what you're doing in the community and that sort of thing. I look at all of the applications because it's important that we pick good people, and that's the way I do it. I even call and ask um, for references look into it. It's important. Um, the comprehensive plan, we all went over it. The only thing is by February 18th, which is this Friday, that's when they're going to shut down the part where you can go in and say what's an asset, what's an opportunity, and what you would like changed. So yeah, just go to the uh, website, Madison on Track 2045, and you can access that there. Um, Hughes update. Okay. Everybody talks about Hughes. I do have an update. Uh, currently, four of the five lanes are completed and waiting on the fifth lane to be shored up before paving can begin. Before the fifth lane can be secured, there are 41 locations on the northbound side of the city and four different utility companies have to coordinate the placement of underground infrastructure. We expect this coordination to be completed within the next 30 days. Once all five entities are in agreement, the city expects it will take four to five months for the utility companies to position their underground assets accordingly. After everything underground is properly positioned, the city contractor will come in to 
to install the proper base for the fifth lane and move to pay the entire length of the project, which will take four months. We expect all five lanes of Hughes Road to be operational by the end of the year. I'm sure there's a lot of people. It is what it is. We will grin and bear it because it is what it is at this point. Um, please see us patient. See if, if somebody needs to get out of their neighborhood on Hughes, please be attentive. I'm one of them. Let me out. You know, it will just, we'll get by. But um, I did want to give you the latest word on what is happening there. And um, this is kind of on a personal note. I, uh, I told y'all back in October that my husband had stage four cancer. Well, I wanted to give an up, a positive update tonight. Um, on December 13th, the PET scan showed that all discernible con can cancer was gone. And so this last Tuesday, the doctor has arranged for my husband to meet with the surgeon, thus hopeful that the part of the colon that had the cancer originally, really, originally, I'm so, I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional on this topic. Excuse me. But um, it is hoped that that bit that caused the problem can be removed and then he can go on. And um, it is just great news. But I bring this up mostly to thank everyone who has stepped up and has been so supportive over the last four months. It has been amazing, the number of people that I have, have brought food. I mean, there are strangers standing at my door bringing me food. It has been just an overwhelming show of support by this wonderful community. And I just had to thank everyone who has been out there, whether they text to sh just to check up on you or to show up at my door or to, to just the prayers and the positive thoughts. And I really did have to, um, I felt that I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been involved. And, and that's all that I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner number seven. Okay, I've got three things. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Parks and Rec. Um, we just got done, I guess, in my son's age group with basketball, but just that whole process in which they did that uh, and, and how all that went uh, through. You know, we did not have basketball season last year. Um, they our favorite C word. But um, uh, we're able to have it this year, and, uh, you know, the kids all seem to have a good time and uh, getting back out and, and doing those things. Uh, second item is so we have planning commission um, coming up this Thursday. And uh, I guess I'll ask anybody that wants to do an over-under uh, <laughs> on that meeting. Apparently, there's a, uh, a line out on that one. But there's a lot of, lot of items on that agenda. And thank you, Mary Beth. <laughs> uh, no problem. Uh, but that's there, uh, 530 here. And so and then the third topic is uh, I, I will, as Mayor Finley did and, and uh, Council Member Denzine did too, I'm going to address uh, masking, but I'll say it from the standpoint of um, so I too have received a phone call to come pick up my kid. He's, you know, gross. Or that, that's my interpretation. I'm not saying yours is. Uh, mine is kind of gross. But, uh, but you know, I've gotten that call as well. Um, uh, and he did come back, you know, positive with COVID. So I was glad that I got the call to be able to, you know, uh, minimize that. Um, my teacher or my teacher, <laughs> my wife is a teacher at second grade at Rainbow. Um, and, and so she's been there uh, during this whole time. Um, I, I'm not going to reveal my personal opinion because I believe just like yours, that's your opinion. And my opinion is, is mine as well. But I can say, and I will say, I speak to all the board members. So I live close to a few of them. Uh, and, and I will express my opinion uh, just as you guys have expressed yours tonight and both to them. Um, and, and I will say, it, in that standpoint, how to hold them accountable is to continue to voice your opinions. Um, that's how this all works. Um, you know, they're not going to come in here and tell us how to vote. And, and at the same time, we're not going to go in there and tell them how to vote and how to run the schools. We can express we're just a regular citizen. Um, and that sounds bad, but, I mean, that is just what we are. Uh, outside of that so um, but again I'm going to do the same thing I would ask you to do I'm going to call my I say my representative they're not district by that manner but uh, I will relay your concerns um, and I will relay my concerns as well um, you know whether that be for or against um, I, again I have my own opinions uh, I think some of you probably understand where those are at but um, from that standpoint 
in my best Forrest Gump voice. That's all I had to say about that. <laughs> That's it. Very good. Thank you very much. So we have no board committee appointments tonight, so we'll move into pu public hearings, and we have several. <clears throat> Uh, the first item is proposed ordinance 2021-387 and this is to own property at uh, 11216 Cardinal Drive, Suite R1A. We should have a graphic coming up for you momentarily. Thank you. Um, you can see that is a, um, a lot in Morris Estate subdivision. Uh, it is 0.61 acres. There's an existing single family house on it. Um, Planning Commission and staff are recommending approval of the zoning and later on in your agenda you'll have um, an annexation item for this item. Uh, at the Planning Commission meeting there wasn't any uh, questions or concerns and it was again supported. I'd like to open the uh, public hearing. Anybody like to address council or mayor? If not we'll close the uh, public hearing. We ask for a motion. Move to approve. Second. Motion is second. Is there any discussion? Can, can I get the vote, please? Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Motion passes. Uh, we do not have a, an exhibit for your second item. Uh, you may recall this was an item that was on your agenda previously. Uh, you had continued it to um, this this evening, um, this is a request to rezone property on Slaughter Avenue from agriculture, um, or excuse me, from R1A to agriculture. At that time, the request consisted of 16 acres. Um, based upon um, the applicant's conversation with the adjacent community, um, they have decided to revise the request down to three acres. Um, and as a result, we had to re-notice this uh, and in order to follow proper noticing procedures, we have to move this meeting to February 28th. Uh, we did notify everybody who came to the council meeting at the last time, everybody who had received emails from at the planning commission level to let them know about the change from the 14th to the 28th. I don't know if anybody is still here for that, um, but we um, are requesting that you continue it again to the 28th. Do we need to vote on that tonight? Yes, please. Um, but I would also check to see if anybody is here to speak to this item. Right. Does anyone like to speak on this subject tonight? If not, can I get a motion? Make a motion to continue till February the 20th. 28th, please. 28th. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion is second. My glasses aren't working well. I was going to say, there ain't but so far. <laughs> I know my, own, my arms are getting a lot shorter. Yes, ma'am. Can I get the vote? Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good evening, uh, the Revenue Department. We've got uh, two public hearings for this evening. Uh, it's going to be the picture of the other one first. Um, we've got a request from J. Alexander's Restaurants, LLC, doing business with J. Alexander's Restaurants. Uh, they've requested a restaurant retail liquor license for the location of 380 down Madison Boulevard. This is a new request. Uh, they're down near the stadium. In the, uh, the police and fire department have signed off, but the building department has not. It's still under construction. Uh, so the recommendation would be to give the consent and we'll have the local license uh, contingent upon getting a certificate of occupancy. Move to approve with the contingency of the building permit being issued. Well, we, we have need to, to open the public, public hearing. hearing. Public hearing first. Okay. Well, then do it. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd like to address council. If not, uh, we'll close the uh, public hearing and now ask You're for on. a motion, Teddy. Well, now that you're asking, I'll give you a motion to <laughs> approve it. With second. All, and all right. Motion is second. Is there any discussion? If not, can I get the vote, please? Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye.
Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. Well, thank you. Uh, the second one, and I, I, I shouldn't try to pronounce the entity's name, I'll just say that it's Papa Jack's number eight at 101 Kaiser Boulevard. They've requested an off premise beer and wine license. Uh, the business has recently been sold. Uh, all departments have signed off. Everything's in order. Yes, we'd like to open the uh, public hearing. Does anyone like to address council? If not, I'll close the uh, public hearing and ask for a motion. Move to approve. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Make vote, please. Mm -hmm. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member mm -hmm. Powell? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, Cameron. Uh, next is, is department reports, and chief without a gun's up. <laughs> chief without a gun. <laughs> the chief without a gun. There you go. Sir. Two chiefs, one with, one without. So we're asking for uh, approval of resolution number 2022-055R, authorizing the purchase of the fire truck equipment from Brindley Mountain Fire Apparatus through the NPP Government Purchasing Cooperative in amount of $23,299 from Sky Budget. Move to approve. Second. Motion and second. Is there any discussion? Okay, vote please. Mm -hmm. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. And also for resolution number 2022-056-R, authorizing the purchase of turnout gear for the fire department from Sunbelt through HVAC purchasing cooperative in the amount of $57,222, again, from our, our currently in our budget. Move to approve. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? Chief, at the sake of sounding ignorant, which I do that really well, what's turnout gear? Tur I'm sorry. Turnout gear is the firefighting ensemble that we wear. The, okay. The turnout pants and the, and the turnout coats. Roger. We wear, and we're replacing 18 of those sets. They, they have a, a life, ex life term of 10 years. Okay. So we have to be trying to we do some every couple of years so we don't end up with a glut of them. All right. Okay. Thank you. Can I need the vote, please? Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you, Chief. Chief with a gun. And Chief with a gun. Shouldn't Chief with a gun go before Chief with a gun? I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm not going to argue either way. He has his six. <laughs> what if he won't? Yep. Chief with a gun probably gets more approved than Chief without a gun. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, but a lot cooler thing that he has. That's true. He <laughs> does have some cooler toys. Yeah. Um, so the... the what we're looking at uh, here in the ordinance uh, 2022-050 is we're looking to change the wording in our current impoundment um, ordinance that currently uh, states that officers shall tow vehicles for unlicensed drivers, suspended licenses, and things like that. Uh, we want to change that shall to may to allow our officers more latitude to be able to find Oftentimes we have these vehicles driven by licensed drivers. The way the code reads now, we have to tow the car, even if there's a licensed driver there. Uh, we also have, I have, uh, in cars I've stopped, allowed uh, people who live nearby to come get the car. And then a couple of officers came to me and said, Chief, you know you're violating your own policy because the policy says we have to tow these cars. So I'm going to change the policy if, if you'll agree to change the ordinance. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just want to change the word shall to may. Very good. Okay. First, reading. First, reading. first reading. First reading. So you keep going, and then we're going to do it next next meeting. I'm sorry. It takes two meetings, so that's the that first, first reading. reading. Yep. First reading. Yep. <laughs> Same with your next one. <laughs> and the next one is simply to repeal the uh, ordinance that allows us to have a uh, reserve uh, police officer corps. Uh, police work has just become way too technical. The training is becoming way too demanding, and the liability is just. Uh, great for us to allow to have part-time police officers. We need to have a full-time. Okay. okay. Good. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. See you next time for the vote. <laughs> next, we got Mary Beth again. Look at the speed. Yeah. Quick. High heels, not too Very quick. quick. I know. 
Oh, it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> Trying to get home. <laughs> um, all right, we have proposed ordinance 2022-388, uh, and this is for the annexation of that property that we were talking about earlier. Again, it's 0.61 acres in the Morris Estate subdivision, and planning commission and staff are recommending approval. Move to approve. Second. second. Motion to second. Is there any discussion? Can I get the vote, please? Councilmember Spears? Aye. Councilmember Powell? Aye. Councilmember Robleski? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. All right, thank you. Your next item is proposed ordinance number 2022-030. And this is for vacation of a portion of utility and drainage easement. There it is. Um, this is a property that is um, on inter or on Intergraph Way, it's behind the Advanced Auto Parts, right next to um, I-565. You can see that red hash area. Um, this is a utility and drainage easement that's not needed. We've approved a hotel for this property, um, and the utility and drainage easements are reconfigured with the approval of that site plan. So they just need to vacate this um, as one of their items to be able to move forward. Move to approve. Second. Motion to second. Is there any discussion? Can I get the vote, please? Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. Your next item is proposed ordinance 2022-10. This is also vacation of utility and drainage easement. This is within the Arlington Park subdivision. This is just a first reading. Um, but where the, this is located on the north side of Royal Drive, this is industrial property, and um, that red dashed area demarcates what was um, previously two separate large lots. Um, this is just east of where the Westchester uh, Road will be extended. And uh, we've recently, the Planning Commission has recently approved a subdivision where those two large lots will become three lots. They're each fairly large. They range in size from eight to 10 acres. But as you can see, that um, former utility and drainage easement smack dab in the middle of the middle lot, and it needs to be removed so that development could proceed on that middle lot. And again, we will be back at your next meeting for approval on this item. But if you have any questions, happy to ask, answer them. All right, and then the last item, this is a um, just a brief report on phase two of the wayfinding um, project. You'll recall that um, the city approved um, hiring a consultant to do a wayfinding uh, phase one. The phase one was to identify the different types of signs and the different locations for, of signs where they, they could be located throughout the city. Um, that was completed, and we do have an exhibit that's coming up. Um, for this uh, and then um, here we go and so here I can uh, I don't think it's on yet so you can't I'm sorry now you can yes thank you um, so all right are you, I'll move it when I okay <laughs> gentlemen let's go back to page one okay here we go all right so um, so we uh, City Council approved the second phase the second phase was to come up with the design for the signs and uh, so the consultant has completed that work. Um, they actually um, gave us a couple of different concepts to look at, and um, we've kind of decided that we think this um, design that I'm going to show you is most compatible with other signs in the city. So um, as you know, we have an existing uh, monument sign at Hughes and Madison Boulevard, which would, of course, remain. And what we wanted to do was to build off of that, that style of the um, sign. So um, as you can see, we've got, the, we've got this stone base at the bottom. That would be the same stone to match the sign that the Hughes and um, Madison Boulevard. Uh, but a lot of our right-of-way areas are smaller than what we've got for that location, and so we wanted to have a smaller sign. The consultant came up with this. Um, the difference between these two signs is this one's got a little cap on the top. This one does not. Um, you can see that um, they have incorporated the city logo, um, the tree, and plant your roots. Mm -hmm. So these, there would only be a handful of these located at um, entrance points into the city. 
um, but this is the concept. They're about uh, 10 feet uh, tall. Mm. Um, you can see the individual there is probably taller than me, but, um, <laughs> but uh, they're about 10 feet tall and, and 8 feet wide or so. Uh, so this is uh, the concept for the primary sign. Then um, these signs right here would be um, secondary gateway signs. The, the difference in these is the, the um, finial. Mm -hmm. So this finial is what is used in the downtown currently. The consultant actually wanted to use, recommended this acorn finial, I'll call it. Um, and then we let them know, well, hey, we've already got these little pointy spikes in downtown, and that could be an issue. So we've got two different options depending on where these signs would go. So these, again, secondary gateways, again, not a lot of these larger signs. Um, but um, one of the things in thinking about these signs is, again, we don't have a lot of right away all the time to um, work with, so we want stuff that's not going to take up a lot of ground space and um, worry about footings and things like that. Um, this is the concept for um, entrance into the downtown. Um, you can see um, in all of those scenarios, they've kind of incorporated the tree. Um, we we kind of like the way that they've done that. Um, at some point, we would bring the downtown sign um, to the downtown business group and talk with them, and then ultimately that would have to go to the Historic Preservation Commission as well. Um, but this is just our first pass at showing you these signs. What will happen to the signs that are down there now? So ultimately, we would look to um, replace the sign. So. For the downtown specifically, we've got in several locations in the city these black signs with white lettering that says Historic Downtown Madison. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to have uniform signage throughout the city. Uh, and so those signs would get replaced. So in just talking a little bit um, about that implementation, these kinds of signs, and I'll show you some more signs in a minute, um, get phased <coughs> in over time. You know, we're not going to necessarily want to uh, afford to put in signs throughout the city. Um, the downtown sign was really the catalyst for this project, right? Wanting to get something on Sullivan Street, for example, as motorists are going by. Um, and I think if we move forward into implementation, that would be um, the location that we'd recommend council go forward with right away. Um, and we've got to figure out how we're going to pay for these signs and so forth. Um, but but we would be, I'd say, strategic in terms of where we would locate signs. Obviously, a cost is a factor and that type of thing. So we may be able to spend X amount of dollars and get 20 signs versus spend that same amount of money and get three signs. So we would have to evaluate, right? Where are you going to get the biggest bang for your buck um, and, and look at implementing this over time. Mary Beth. Is that a cutout? Is that a cutout of that tree or is that a tree on a white background? Um, it, it is being shown as I we think a cutout but that's where we our next phase if we get to a next phase is really getting into the fabrication so would that just be on a white background would it be a cutout can we a, do a white background and have it on there and have that be less expensive presumably easier to maintain so those are the things that we would look at I'm sorry, Connie. that's okay you talked about the I'm um, call it a steeple finial versus the acorn finial yeah for downtown, but then the historic, the taller historic downtown signs have the acorn. Right. If we're so going to use, if we're going to be consistent yeah. in the downtown, let's be consistent in the downtown. Right. Just so, my opinion. So they're showing right up here. I don't know what happened to my little guy. Okay. Do you see now? It's not working right now. But do you see in the upper right hand corner the different finial? Yes. So they're just showing you that there are these different ones, and so. So they, that's not the final design for the down. Okay. No. Fine. Right. Um, and you can see on these signs, they're showing the, what did you call it, the steeple one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The steeple finial. So, again, uh, we'll finalize that. Okay, great. Thank um, you. Go back. All right. So um, there are lots of different types of signs um, depending upon um, whether it's at an intersection, whether you're on a, um, a collector road versus, a, say, a, a larger arterial road where people are traveling um, faster in their vehicles. So depending upon the, um, the location of the sign and what we're trying to achieve with the sign dictates 
the type of sign. And so the first phase, um, there's a map, and it shows all of these different sign types um, in different locations throughout the city. Um, and it's a fairly you know, detailed menu, I will say. So this graphic is showing you a lot of different types of sign, again, depending upon what you're trying to achieve and the function. Um, I'll just point out a couple. This little guy right here um, is intended to be for the downtown, so we're envisioning that maybe, let's say, at the corner of Wise and Main Street. <coughs> so if you're parking, right, it's going to be a map. It's going to show you where different businesses are, different locations. There could also be one at the parking lot, right, and Martin Street and, um, and Garner, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that was also a request um, because there's a, a mapping um, application, um, so we'll include that. Um, obviously, the parking sign is, is sort of an obvious uh, parking sign. Um, and the, these are, um, again, would be located along the street depending upon, this one would be, let's say, um, when you're getting to an intersection. So it's really um, geared towards the, the motorist who's slowing down or maybe at a stop sign. And so it's got a little bit more information. Those signs are a little bit smaller versus these where someone is um, driving along on the roadway. And that just shows the different finial. And I think that's it. So. Um, Happy to answer any questions, and then um, ultimately, um, with the mayor's office, we'll be talking about next steps. Um, if you like this design, then um, you know I probably will go forward, talk with the downtown group, talk with HPC, the Historic Preservation Commission, um, and then figure out what a phase three might look like. Very good. Good. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thumbs up. <laughs> I like it. You like them. Oh. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Thank, Thank you. So much. Thank you. <clears throat> and legal. Favorite person. Oh. All right. I have a number of items for your consideration this evening. And the first two are related, and both of them are proposals to hire a contractor to repair some hail damage at city buildings. The first is Resolution 2022-14R to award a bid for roofing for the Dublin Park Administration Building and Gym to GKL Companies Incorporated in the amount of $122,000, and that's to be paid from contingency and insurance reimbursement funds. Move to approve. Second. Motion and second. Is there any discussion? Can I get the vote, please? Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Motion passes. Excellent. And then the second one is Resolution 2022-15R to award the bid for roofing for Fire Station 1 to the same company, GKL Companies Incorporated, in the amount of $62,500, also to be paid from contingency and insurance reimbursement funds. Move to approve. Second. Right. Motion is second. I got a quick question about that. Are sure. both of these um, shingled roofs, or are we going back with metal? Do we know? I think he was I looking at shingled. metal, but I think it's going to be shingled, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. They evaluated the upgrade to the other type of roof, but it was just too expensive for the funding that we had right now. Okay. Can I get the vote, please? Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. All right. And then the next two items are also related, and these both pertain to the energy services program that our consultant, Noresco, has provided for you all. And so I have a very short presentation and a reminder of what this program is all about. We have Mr. Barry Gillespie from Noresco here in case you have any technical questions about the project. And of course, Roger is here for any other detailed financing questions. As you recall, about a year ago, you all approved an agreement for Noresco to mobilize, to develop, design, and engineer an energy services program so that the city could take energy conservation measures to save lots of money over time. 
They've been engaged in the development and the design phase, and now we've reviewed all of the agreements to allow us to go forward into the construction phase and commissioning and performance phase. As you recall, the, the point of this program is to provide self-funding infrastructure improvements with guaranteed savings over time that the city can leverage to actually implement the energy conservation measures that Noresco is recommending and then have some money left over for other general city purposes. And you can see how the uh, flow of funds works in the graph on the right side of this slide. So for a while, some of those savings will be tied up, but then they're freed up after the term of the agreement to be able to be used for many other city purposes. The point is, you know, the point of this arrangement is not to put any additional burden on taxpayers or city staff. So there is an agreement with Huntsville Utilities included as part of this that uh, provides for the city to purchase those street lights so that we save money on investment charges. But Huntsville Utilities is going to keep on maintaining the pole. So we reduce the burden on the public work staff. Noresco has recommended two major tracks for taking these en energy conservation measures at the City Hall, fire stations, Dublin Park and the sports fields, and then throughout Madison for all of the street lights. And those are replacing the old energy inefficient light bulbs with new LED light bulbs and also making various HVAC system improvements. If this agreement is approved tonight, then construction and installation can begin soon and the city will make progress payments over time. The total cost of the project is approximately $4.7 million. And if the city moves forward, the city will realize approximately $6.3 million in savings over the next 16 years and then more beyond that time period. With that, I'd like to review the content of the resolutions that are up for approval this evening. The first one is Resolution 2022-63R. This approves the agreement with Noresco itself to implement the program from start to finish. It also approves the Huntsville Utilities Agreements that are associated with this deal, and that includes the agreement for the purchase of streetlights in the amount of $214,961 to be paid from general fund and gas tax funds. It includes the maintenance agreement for the streetlights so that Huntsville Utilities will continue to take on that responsibility. It also includes a pull attachment agreement so that the city's contractor, Noresco, is free to attach the LED light fixtures to the poles that Huntsville Utilities does not intend to sell to the city and they're retaining some of them that actually have uh, utili fixtures from other utilities on them. The second resolution is 2022-65R and that approves the agreement with TD Equipment Finance to pay for the construction expenses in the amount of $4.7 million. And I'd like to note that both of these agreements are contingent on the approval of the Board of Huntsville Utilities and we anticipate them to pass those next week at the February 23rd board meeting. And with that, we'll be glad to take any questions that you have. Move to approve. Second. Motion is second. Is there any discussion? I, I'm just curious, have any council members gotten any feedback from any residents of the LED lights installed in their neighborhood? I've gotten questions. And yeah, will there be a chance for the citizens to say how bright, whether they want them different voltage or not voltage LED so that's more of an operational question Barry is that something that you could speak to yes, okay, you. Uh, no we can't hear you, <laughs> can't hear you, on, to the microphone. Can't hear you on TV yeah. it, it is okay. for us but not for them <laughs> so we had put some samples in and I heard from Roger some of the feedback and uh, I'm just like you guys I live in South Alabama Alabama power replaces lights on my street I don't want the harsh white light, so we've reduced the Kelvin, we've reduced the CRI, <coughs> the lights that we're using, and we've also ordered shields for every one of Good. those lights. Um, and I'll take it a step further, and I don't want to put Roger on the spot, but we had a brief conversation. If the city chose to install the intelligence on top of that, which would be like a UV cell plug and play that would give you maintenance savings, additional energy savings, you can actually dim those lights with, with advanced lighting. So uh, that's another opportunity down the road. But for, for now, uh, Councilwoman Denzine, which you had asked about mm -hmm. regarding the community in general, uh, we are down to 2,700 <coughs> Kelvin with a different color rendering or CRI so that the harsh light isn't quite as 
harsh in mm -hmm. someone's backyard and it also brings the uh, not the voltage someone said voltage but it brings down yeah, the right. wattage for that mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm sensitive to that mm -hmm. I, i'm sure everyone else is as well thank you i think those shields i think the shields will really help right now yeah. i mean that doesn't mean we'll put one on every right we have one available for every okay. residential light okay i have one for you <laughs> thank you so much okay. so uh, do you have more um so what i heard you say is you're going with more of a soft white instead of the cool white what I heard you just say in lower lumens to make sure that it's not like just blasting everybody. Correct. But I'm curious about, so 4.7 million after 16 years or sometime less than that will break even. What does the lifetime, what like home, what's the operational cost of these? Like how often do we need to replace a light? Gosh, good what's question. the cost of those? Um, I don't know those things, so curious. I think that's a great question. First of all, it's not break even. It's not a budget neutral position. Our uh, calculations show that you guys should actually have a net positive of about $499,000 by the end of the term. Second question is we give a, an additional supply of lighting uh, lamps to public works when we do the installation. We'll do the pre and post uh, measurements, we'll do the pre and post inspections, we'll do the labeling of the poles. So uh, it, it's very much a turnkey type of solution. Uh, those lights are guaranteed to last a minimum of 10 years. Most are lasting 15 to 20 years now. Okay. The LED has come a very, very long way in terms of quality. But now you still get what you pay for, right? So we, we, we're working with the right kind of vendors and I'm actually in smart city development, and I do this across the country with street lighting. I filled in for Brian Stone when he left, uh, so you ended up with me. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. I, I do have some knowledge in that area. Okay. Thank you, sir. Did that answer your question? I did, yes, you sir. You talked about the little fixtures on top of the lighting sure. that gives you, like, community mood lighting. Um, <laughs> is that part of this, or is that something else that we'd have to add? Uh, you could add it as an amendment, an addendum. Uh, it's about another $390,000 because this particular cell, which is about a five second to 10 second installation, I was explaining to Roger, why would you want to pay someone twice to bring in a bucket truck and go up and down and then up and down later again and pay you know, two times to do that when you can have sensors for citizen services, uh, vibration sensors, uh, maintenance, data that can, can be extracted from that. It's really the basis for a smart city or a municipal Wi-Fi system. So what's, what's the cost savings to put that module on top? Uh, that would pay for itself in one year. And, and how? And in what manner? Uh, the sensors on it would, would give you both operational and energy savings. Okay. And who's responsible for those sensors? Because I know at this point utilities is are they going to be responsible for that sensor part of it too or is that going to put an extra burden well the the cell itself councilman is that what you're asking about yes is additional sensors when that has to be replaced oh it would uh, yeah no we would be responsible for that so I mean if, if you're asking if there's a tech refresh over the course of the program uh, the answer is that we would guarantee or uh, maintain those through the course of the 16-year term. Okay, so no updates or anything like that? You know, that's a, no. Right now in Miami-Dade, we're replacing 27,000 lights over a 20-year term, and we don't foresee any updates in that area. Okay. And by the way, I wouldn't steer you wrong. I used to live here. We moved away in 2010. You guys have a lovely city. At one time, I had sons in Rainbow, Discovery and Bob Jones, so mm -hmm. that was a great place. Still left us. Pardon me? You still left, though. I, I do. I, I, I'm married out of here and in <laughs> Alabama, but I'm here. I've got a follow-up question. Um, we had studied your projections in terms of savings over the course of the contract. Is there a interim, annual, some type of review where we actually get to see if the numbers actually materialize that we projected when we first? Yes, ma'am. There's uh, an annual measurement and verification uh, program that's built into the 16-year term. So once a year, we'll sit down with uh, the council, 
uh, whomever you, or whomever you designate. Well, the Finance Committee, could you come every year sure to an annual meeting so we could just see how the... Absolutely. It's just a very important part of the program. It's based on IP MVP protocol, which is a national protocol, and we follow that standard. So you know you're getting uh, a very fair assessment of what you're actually saving in terms of kilowatt hours, therms, and I know that Dustin's going to be really pleased that we're going to clean out the pipe here for City Hall and replace that split system at your third fire station because that's on its last leg. So a lot of good things are going to happen with this project. And when you were talking about the additional sensor, is there a reason why you would only put them, say, in the residential lighting areas? Is that where you really get the, the need, the additional oh, no. sensor in terms of dimming or... Oh, no, I would, I would recommend putting those on every street light. I was saying that you may only want to put shields in the residential areas because you would want, for safety purposes, to be as well lit as possible. Actually, it's the fluorescent lights that kind of meander out, and there's a much more focused flow okay. of light from an LED. But with that sensor, you know, during times of emergencies, you could turn the lights up all the way, or you could dim them when you don't, you know, if you feel like it's it's coming into your house. Mm -hmm. You do that from Sir? from an app on the phone, or how do you do that with the? Uh, you you do it remotely. It can it can be. Or your your police chief, fire chief. That oh, they, it's a great they first responder program. Yes, sir. Well, you, that could be in the hands of your first responders mm -hmm. uh, for a whole lot of different types of services. And I've sent Roger the specs on that. Uh, and, and, and I'm sorry I took us way off subject with the intelligence, but um, I just think it's a great thing to add. Why pay twice mm -hmm. for someone to go up in a bucket truck? Are you with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay so would, yeah. would we have to just amend what we have just to add that portion of it? Yeah, we're going to do it. Do add it now. that amendment to it. I'd, I'd like, like to add an amendment to I don't know. I guess we make that in the motion. I would just ask for you to approve resolution 2022-63-R uh, with the amendment of that additional feature, and then that will free us up to go ahead and work on the paperwork to get that wrapped up. Okay. Move to approve with that amendment. Second. Motion is second. Is there any discussion? Now, I'll get this letter to you. It's a very knowledgeable person on the whole thing, and you could probably just answer these questions very quickly and without... Taking up more time here. Okay, thank you. Mm, this fellow is named Jeff. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can, can I get the vote, please? Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And I'd also like to ask for approval of Resolution 2022-65R to provide for the financing. And I think we'll need to ask for the same amendment. Roger, would you like to ask for that? Barry, what were you saying the additional amount would be for the 400000 Okay. Four hundred. Uh, so 390 Okay. Not to exceed. Well, Can we do a not to exceed? Okay. So not to exceed 350, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> you say 300? What? Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> what do you say? Not to exceed like 400. I think not to exceed 400. So make a motion to approve and add the additional money not to exceed 400,000. Yes. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? That's probably the best motion I've made all night long. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I get the vote, well please. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And the final resolution is Resolution 2022-64R. This is to approve the annual inmate housing agreement with the Madison County Sheriff and the Madison County Commission at the rate of $55 per day. Move to approve. Second. 
Motion to second. Is there any discussion? Okay, the vote, please. Council Member Robleski? Aye. Council Member Powell? Aye. Council Member Spears? Aye. Council President Shaw? Aye. Council Member Bartlett? Aye. Council Member Denzine? Aye. Council Member Seaford? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there any miscellaneous business or announcements? Mm -hmm. Not. Motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Very good. So be it. You can see them uh, start to materialize, and it's really